Greetings, Redeemer members and friends, those of you watching from around the world. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to pause during your day and to give your attention to this recording. We hope that you're going to be edified by the gospel truth that you have an opportunity to sing along to and that you're going to hear from God's Word uh, from 2 Samuel. And we hope that you'll also be led to engage with others outside of these videos by some of the opportunities that we'll mention. This past week, I was with some of our church members and we reflected on Psalm 122. That Psalm of David opens with the reflection, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. There David was, he was giving this joyful uh, voice of the experience of God's people when they join with others to go to a particular place to look to their Lord, to know his presence. Do you remember what that feels like? Brothers and sisters, because of these Distancing measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19, it's been so long since we had the joy of gathering together for public worship here in Dubai. We miss that. We long for the return to days where we can call our friends and say, hey, let's, let's go to the house of the Lord this Friday. But these times also remind us that the, the house that we're seeking is, is not just a temporary one put up in a hotel ballroom on Fridays or a more sturdy one put up on the outskirts of town. But the house of the Lord that we seek is an eternal one, one that has many rooms that Jesus went ahead to prepare a place for us, one where the Father is standing at the door welcoming home the prodigals and the hypocrites. The gospel that we believe and preach here at Redeemer tells us that by grace, the unmerited favor of God, that through the atoning death and resurrecting power of Jesus Christ, by turning from our sin and believing in His name for salvation, we will find life in His name and be welcomed home in eternity. COVID-19 might be temporarily taking away our joy of gathering right now, but no sin or shame can take away our everlasting joy when Jesus welcomes us home with those from every tribe, tongue, and nation that have bowed a knee to Him. So as we await for return to public worship, let's be prayerful that that would come. Let's also pray and seek to encourage others while we wait. We can still call and message our friends and fellow church members and say to them, let's go. Let's keep going. Let's not give up. Let's run this race with endurance together. We can still meet others in, in small numbers in public places, so let's do that. Let's open the Bible together. Let's point one another to our hope in Christ. Every connection that you make this next week could be a catalyst to someone else saying, it was good when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. 
as we proceed in this video. Before we join together in song and looking to scripture, I have a few announcements for you along with a special look at our Redeemer Kids videos and a word on giving. First, announcements. Members, if you are a member of Redeemer Church of Dubai, we want to remind you that we'll be having our monthly member Zoom call this Friday, so most of you, I think that's today, 16th October at 5 p.m. During these pandemic months, these calls have been sweet opportunities to hear updates from around the church and discuss member news, uh, bring people into our membership, or say goodbye to those who can move on. So we want to make you, uh, encourage you to make it a priority to join us. You should have received an email uh, earlier in this week, and then also uh, one even this afternoon that'll have that Zoom link for you. So we'll see you there, members. And if you're not yet a member of our church, but you would like to be, uh, you want to be counted among our number, you want to be in covenant relationship with us and joining your voice with us and saying, let's go, then you're most welcome to do that. The next opportunity to get that process started is taking a membership class. And we're going to do that on the 23rd of October. So you'll have a chance to meet some of our elders and staff, hear about the vision and values of the church, and also meet others that are seeking to join the church. Uh, it's going to be in person, uh, but we're going to be following all distancing and health and safety protocols. So we really hope that you join us. If you're interested, you can register in the link that's going to be below on your screen. And you can also just check out our website and RSVP because we do need to know ahead of time if you're coming. So whether you've been attending for a long time or just started kind of tuning in and connecting with us over these videos, uh, whoever you are, you're welcome to come and join us. Make Redeemer Church of Dubai your church home. Well, one of the things that Angel and I and the kids have been enjoying at our home lately is the new Redeemer Kids videos, going through a, a series called Our Amazing God. The kids have loved these fun and encouraging videos. I think Judson Iwachuku joyfully praising the Lord through his hiccups was my highlight of the last week. And in case you haven't seen these videos or just as a fun reminder for you, here's a glimpse at some of what's been going on in our Amazing God Redeemer Kids videos. Check it out. how God is the epitome of pure, unblemished love through the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Now you're probably wondering, feet and love? What have they got to do with each other? Well, that's where we turn to the Bible and open up to John chapter 13, verses 1 to 17, where we're going to learn about the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. My superpower is flying! Superpower is better because he can be everywhere. My superpower is making things disappear. But God is even more amazing because he can actually remove my sins. Watch me! Did you see me jump to the pool? Does that make me holy? No, only Jesus makes me holy. And He's the Lord. Grisha, where are you off to? I have a measuring tape, and I'm here to measure the depth of the sea. Oh, hi there. I heard you're off to measure the sea. Did you know that God's love is so amazing that you can't measure its depth or its width? 
He took my sin. He took my sin. He took my sin. He's so good to me. Wow, how great to see all those children and parents and church members coming together to bless the kids of Redeemer. After you finish this video today, uh, you can jump over to our Redeemer uh, YouTube page. You'll see all the Our Amazing God videos there and you can share them with the uh, kids or the otherwise young at heart uh, that you have in your life. Well, changing gears from kids to generosity, I wanna take a few moments here just to share a few thoughts with all of us on the topic of giving. We had considered earlier the encouragement to be generous with our encouragement towards others. And I want to encourage us as well to consider how can we be generous with our finances towards others and towards the ministry of the gospel. One of the joys of following Christ is that we are released from our bondage to this world and what it can offer us, what security and what gain we can get from it. And one of the chief ways that we can experience the blessing of that freedom is through the grace of giving. Now, of course, it's, it's good and wise and noble to follow biblical wisdom on managing your finances so that you don't unnecessarily become a burden on others or unable to be generous. And, and that's a key reason that we have our biblical finance class. It's currently going on and seeking to help bring God's word to bear on how we organize our money as Christians. But we also realize that especially in a challenging economy like we are in right now, job losses have been taking place. Salary cuts seem to be part of the new normal for many of us. And the sense of fear generally just leaves all of us in a place where we're wanting to cling to whatever we have to be secure. And friend, as we've said before, if that's you, we'd love for you to please reach out to us so that we can care for you in some way. You can find the Get Help form on our website and one of our staff members uh, will reach out to you to hear more about the situation that you're in. Consider any ways that the church could walk alongside of you. But even while you know, we imperfectly try to manage our money, uh, even while the things might be tight for some, uh, and then for others of us, maybe we find ourselves with more than we've had in the past. Uh, but even as all of us, just whatever station we're in, look at the early church, the book of Acts, and in the New Testament epistles, one thing that we see there is that they were generous to the needs of the poor and to the expenses of the church. And so I think we can take that example and ask, Lord, what would you have us to cheerfully give during this time? Our Benevolence Fund continues to operate to respond to those who reach out for help. And if you'd like to give over and above your general offering to the church, those monies will be stewarded well for those who need it uh, most. And, and as our staff team and elders start to develop a new ministry budget for 2021, your faithful and regular giving to the church helps us to plan ahead prayerfully and expectantly. We don't want to shrink back as a church during these days. We want to press forward and continue our mission of making disciples of all nations. The elders, the staff, the members, all of us join together in this effort. As Pastor Dave noted last week, we're certainly seeing a downward trend in giving to the church. We are going to walk by faith and, and make any necessary adjustments uh, that we need to, regardless of whatever amounts come in. But those numbers do highlight for us the need to remind one another to care for those who are hurting during these days and also to consider how each of us might experience the truth of what our Lord Jesus says, that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so for details on, on how you can give towards both the benevolence and the regular giving locally here in the UAE uh, by bank transfer or ATM deposit, or even internationally to our US account, you can go to the link below or, or find it on our website, redeemerdubai.com slash give. Well, let's bow our heads in a, in a word of prayer now before we sing. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray in faith, knowing that you will provide every good thing that we need in Jesus Christ. Lord, you will provide the finances that we need for the ministry that you have for us here in this city and beyond. And Father, we trust and we, we pray that you will provide everything that each one of our members needs, each one in this city needs in order to live their lives in a godly way. Father, provide mercy for them. Lord, for those in need, would you provide help for them? For the sick, would you provide healing for them? And for all of us, Lord, would you provide your spirit so that we can grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ? Would you even do that now as we sing together in Jesus' name? Amen. I want to encourage you now, wherever you are, in, in your room, uh, just out in public, wherever it might be, uh, just go ahead and stand up and uh, hear these songs, but don't just hear them. Sing with us, uh, with whoever you are. Sing to the Lord 
uh, rejoicing in his name. Let's sing. Redeemer. It's a joy to have you uh, with us today uh, to spend some time in 2 Samuel uh, chapters 5 and 6. Uh, this year has been a strange time and new concepts have become quite familiar. The idea of social distancing, the idea of contact tracing, things we might not have heard of before have become very familiar. But for me, they, they feel strangely familiar and they take me back to when I was about 10. See, when I was 10 years old, uh, my younger brother was diagnosed with leukaemia and he went through a year of intensive chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And this chemotherapy, radiotherapy, as it attacked the cancer in his body, it also destroyed his immune system. 
And it meant that while he was being treated for the cancer, uh, he had to be very careful. Because of his compromised immune system, he couldn't go out into crowds. Uh, people were now dangerous for him uh, because the common cold was dangerous and to catch chicken pox, uh, which for anyone else would be just a few days at home, uh, for my brother, it could become fatal. His compromised immune system meant that he couldn't be in the presence of people. Uh, yet my parents believed that relationships were important, that he needed to keep up his relationships. And so they made a way for him to be able to see people. Uh, it seems like the original contact, contact tracing. So the day before uh, his team's soccer game, uh, my mum would get on the phone and call every mother in the team to check, has your child been sick? Have they been to any large parties? And if all seemed clear, then my mum knew it was safe to take my brother to just watch the soccer game, even for a few minutes. Uh, before a day of school, uh, if we wanted him to visit just for an hour or so, uh, my mum would get on the phone and call almost every person in the class, checking, has your child been sick? Uh, is, have they been to any large parties? Do you know anyone who's been sick? And if everything was clear, well, then he could go. Uh, you see, because of his compromised immune system, he couldn't be in the presence of people. Uh, yet, because relationship was important, uh, my parents made a way. And, and praise God, he, he did recover. He made a full recovery. Uh, but as we come to this section of 2 Samuel, I think we'll see a similar dynamic. Because we, as sinful humans, we can't stand in the presence of God. We are compromised. Not our immune system, but because of sin, we are compromised. And that means we can't stand in the presence of a sin-free God. We are unholy. He is holy. Uh, we are fallen and broken. He is completely good. So we can't stand in his presence. Yet we'll see in this passage and we'll be reminded today uh, that our God has made a way for sinful people like us to have relationship and joy in the presence of him, a holy God. And last week, uh, Pastor Dave brought us through chapters one to four and the death, the deception, it, it was a mess, wasn't it? Uh, but we saw through it all that God was accomplishing his purposes, fulfilling his promise that David would be king over all Israel. And in chapter five, we reached that conclusion uh, we don't have the time to spend there today, uh, but in chapter 5, verse 12, we're told that David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he'd exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. God's king, David, was now established in God's place in Jerusalem, ruling over all of God's people, all the tribes of Judah and Israel. But there was still one thing missing. And that was God's presence. And that's what we'll turn to in chapter six. And we'll see in chapter six, three things that we're to rejoice in God's presence, uh, that we're to fear God's presence. And thirdly, that we can rejoice in the holy God who has made a way. Firstly, we can rejoice in God's presence because the God of the universe dwells with his people. Chapter six begins with David gathering one of the largest armies he, he ever, ever pulls together. But it's not to attack an enemy or defend from an enemy. He gathers these 30,000 men uh, because he wants to go and collect the ark. This is a momentous occasion. It's a time of great joy. Now, listen to it uh, here in chapter six, verses one to five. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baalai Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, uh, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. This was a big deal. 
One of the biggest parties Israel had ever seen. One of the biggest armies David had ever gathered. We're told that all the house of Israel was there with them, celebrating before the Lord. Now, I expect that maybe the first time that we gather on a Friday as a church, there'll be this kind of rejoicing, uh, this kind of celebration. Yet why is this such a big deal? Are they getting the ark, like a wooden box about this big and bringing it into the city? Well, it's a big deal because the ark represented the presence of God among his people. The God of all the universe, uh, the God who made the earth and the planets and all the people, he promises that he will be present with his people. And in verse little two, that little box they carry into Jerusalem, well, it's called the Ark of God, called by the name of the Lord of hosts who sits enthroned on the cherubim. Now, God doesn't live inside the little box, but God gave his people this Ark uh, to represent his presence with them to show that he really was their God, to show that he was with them in their midst, in relationship with them. It represented that he was their king. As we're told, the Lord sits enthroned. It represents his relationship with him as it was placed in the midst of their city. So the ark being brought into Jerusalem, the new centre of the nation, well, it symbolised God's presence with his people. He would be their God. They would be his people. They could have relationship with him and that was a reason to celebrate. Uh, That's why we're told they were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines, castanets and cymbals. In fact, this whole chapter is about the presence of God. The Ark is the Ark of the Lord. And the Lord, the capital L-O-R-D, when you see that in the Bible, that's God's personal name that he gave to his people. Uh, Anyone could talk of God, some God up there in the sky. But when God called this people to himself, he gave them his personal name. He said, you can call me the Lord, Yahweh. And that showed their relationship. Within families, we can have nicknames for each other that only the family knows. Uh, Sometimes a husband and wife might have special names for each other, which is very embarrassing if they accidentally use that name when they're out in public but it shows their relationship. In the same way, this name, the Lord, it was given because God was in relationship with his people. And this whole whole chapter is about that relationship, that they can be in the presence of God. In fact, the, the words before the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, they appear six times in this passage. Verse 5, verse 14, verse 16, verse 17, and verse 21. Uh, This whole chapter is about being in God's presence. So it's worth stopping here just to remember that we can rejoice in God's presence. The God of the universe, he wants to know us. He wants to dwell with us. Though David had defeated his enemies and gotten peace and arrived in Jerusalem and was finally king, all of this was a purpose. Uh, All of this had a purpose. Uh, He was king. They defeated enemies. They got settled so that they could be in God's presence. And that's why they rejoiced at this time. Uh, We need to rejoice too. The ruler of the heavens, the maker of the universe, he doesn't leave us to ourselves to figure out what God is like, to try to reach up or work our way up to find him. He has come to us. He's revealed himself to us and he wants relationship with us so that he can be our God and we can be his people. And while in David's time in the Old Testament, uh, he revealed himself through the name, the Lord, well, now he's revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Where the ark was called by the name of the Lord of hosts, we're now told that Jesus Christ is the Lord. God's presence is no longer represented by an ark inside a tent or a temple, but God became present as he came to earth as a man, Jesus Christ. And because Jesus died and rose again and was ascended to heaven, well, now he can be present with us by his Holy Spirit. So all of you who call in on the name of Jesus, you can rejoice. Rejoice in God's presence because the God of all the universe, he calls you his child. He wants relationship with you and he dwells with you by his spirit.
No matter where we go, God is with us. He is our God, we are His people. No matter who else comes or goes, our God remains with us. He is our God and we are His people. No matter whether we feel His presence or not, we can rejoice that He is present because He's promised to all who trust Him that He is our God. This is the great hope that the Bible gives us, that God dwells with us, that we can know Him. Yet, as we'll see, there is a problem. There's an obstacle that prevents sinful people like us from relationship, from dwelling with a holy God. So we must, secondly, fear God's presence. We see it in verse 6 to 10. We're to fear God's presence because sinful people cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. Uh, Let's return to that party in verse 5. All of Israel celebrating, carrying the ark of the Lord in. Uh, But as they're they're celebrating, the music is blaring, something's going to stop them dead in their tracks. Now, sometimes I feel like I've got this skill. So I can be at a party, sort of, and the conversation is flowing with maybe parents from school or neighbours, and everyone's talking and everyone's having a good time. Then someone says, oh, hey, Morgan, what do you do for a job? And I just need to say one word. I need to say, pastor. And I feel like I can kill the party. The conversation stops. They don't know what to say. Uh, but here we, we have one of those moments. Uh, the party's going on. Israel is celebrating. They're carrying the ark of the Lord in. And we're told in verse 6, when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of the Lord. Now, this is confronting, isn't it? Everyone was celebrating. They were celebrating in the presence of the Lord. But we're told that this same Lord, he's the one who struck down Uzzah. It looked like Uzzah was trying to help. Uh, Surely the real tragedy would have been if he hadn't reached out and the oxen had sort of bumped the the whole ark off the cart and it smashed on the ground. Why why would God do this? Uh, We see that that's how David felt. Verse 8, David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to that day. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now in David's fear, even in David's anger, we see that David recognises something important. Where to fear God's presence. Because sinful people cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. David doesn't want the ark in Jerusalem anymore because if the ark's in the city, that means God is in the city and sinful people can't stand in the presence of God. We are compromised by our sin, therefore we can't be with this holy God. Even though we were made for relationship with him, we cannot be in his presence. Like the slightest amount of light will instantly destroy any darkness it meets. We who are sinful and unholy will be destroyed in the presence of a holy God. That's why Adam and Eve, after their first sin, they had to leave the Garden of Eden where they'd walked with God. But God still loves us. God still desires relationship with us. And so he always acts to make a way for sinful people to come into his presence. In ancient Israel, this was through his laws. His laws said that even though you're stained by sin, if you make these sacrifices, your guilt will be taken away and you can come into my presence. Even though you are an unholy people, I'll give you priests and they can stand between us to mediate so that we can be together. Even though you're sinful, he said, if you obey my commands, you can live as my special people. And these laws God gave, they weren't a burden because they told his people exactly what they needed to to do so they could have relationship with him. The real burden would be if he didn't tell them what to do. If they had to guess, maybe God wants us to do this, or maybe God wants us to do that, and maybe we should try doing this or that. Where God didn't leave them to guess, 
He said, I've made a way for you to have relationship with me. Even though because of your compromised sin, your compromised immune system, because of your sin, you can draw near to me uh, through the way I have provided. Now, we're familiar with instructions. You know, Pastor Dave loves to talk about his f- favourite shopping centre and that big sort of blue and yellow furniture store in that shopping centre. I think as, as famous as the blue and yellow sign for that, that store is the instructions that come with its furniture. You know, you open the box and along with all the different pieces, there's these instructions. And, and we laugh at the instructions and the funny little figures and drawings and we can get sick of them if we've got a whole room of furniture to build. But you really start to appreciate these instructions when you buy furniture from pretty much anywhere else. Because you buy furniture from somewhere else and you don't have these detailed diagrams. You've suddenly got words describing one thing and, and another thing, or you've just got nothing. You've got a guess for yourself. At that moment, you really appreciate those detailed instructions and diagrams. Same way God tells his people exactly what they need to draw near. But it's important that we listen. How does all of this relate to poor Uzzah lying there beside the ark? Well, it looks like David and the people of Israel had forgotten that while they could enjoy God's presence, they enjoyed it on his terms. They could draw near to God, but only through the way he had provided And as he'd provided a way through his laws, he'd also provided very clear instructions on how to move the ark. We go to Numbers chapter 4, verse 5. We're told that when the camp is to be set out, Aaron and his sons go in and take down the veil of the screen and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Then they put it on, put on it a covering of goat skin and spread on top of that a cloth of all blue and shall put in its poles. So the ark was to be covered, and it doesn't look like David and and Israel did that. Verse 15 of Numbers 4 uh, tells us that when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary and the camp is set out, after that the sons of Kohath shall come to carry these, but they must not touch the holy things, lest they die. So they're not allowed to touch any of the holy things, especially the ark, which was the most holy In Numbers chapter 7, verse 6, we're told that Moses took wagons and oxen and gave them to the Levites, the priests. And in verse 9, but to the sons of Kohath, who were meant to carry the ark, he gave none because they were charged with the service of the holy things that had to be carried on the shoulder. So there's another clear command from God. The ark was not to be carried on um, on, on any kind of of, of animal or any kind of cart, even the new, the new cart, it was meant to be carried on the shoulder. And David explains it in the book of First Chronicles. First Chronicles is another account which includes David's reign. And David says this, he says in verse 13 of chapter 15, because you did not carry it the first time, the Lord God broke out against us because we, di- because we did not seek him according to the rule. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. So while Uzzah seemed to have the right intentions, we're told that Uzzah was struck down because he'd broken God's law. Uh, they were to uh, they were to not touch the ark. Uh, they were to carry it rather than putting it on a cart. While they celebrated God's presence, they forgot that they could only draw near to God on His terms because He had made a way. And to approach Him in any other way, to relate to Him in any other way, is dangerous. And this remains true for us. God's made a way for us to dwell with him, a way to be reconciled, a way to have a restored relationship with him. And it's not by laws or priests or arcs, but it's through Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection for us. This gives us great confidence. This assures us that we are God's people and he is our God. But even as we draw near through Jesus, we shouldn't grow complacent. 
God remained the holy God. God still gives command through his word. And though we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus, Jesus is not only saviour, but he is our Lord, our King. And he gives us commands to obey. As we rest in the love of Christ, we're to remember Jesus' words that if you love me, you'll keep my commands. As we seek to live for Christ, we're to remember that he's told us how to live for him. If we celebrate before God on the weekend, uh, yet only seek our own glory and gratification during the week, we're forgetting that we have a holy God. If we show our love for God before people at church, uh, but indulge our own desires when we're in private, we need to remember that we have a holy God, the same God who struck down Uzzah. As believers, we can sometimes say, I'm seeking God's will in something. And often that's because God's word doesn't give us guidance and we just need to use our wisdom to decide either, either good way. But sometimes we say we're seeking God's will where God's already clearly revealed his will in his word. We're seeking his will as to whether I should tell a lie or not in, in this situation. We need to look back to his clear commands. If we think that we could serve the kingdom of God by progressing in our career, but it might take a couple of shortcuts or a bit of dishonesty or some, well, we need to actually be careful and say, even though we might have the right intentions, God has been very clear as to what he requires. If we're seeking his will as to whether to marry someone uh, who uh, doesn't know Christ, well, we need to look back to his clear commands to see he has guided us, he has spoken, he has revealed his will in his word. Our God is the holy God, the God who struck down Uzzah. And though we're reconciled to him through Christ, though we can have confidence in his presence through Christ, we continue to relate to him on his terms because he's made a way for us and shown it to us in his word. So God God dwells with his people. Uh, we, we can't stand in his presence. He has made a way. But as this, this account continues, we'll see that actually they, they try again. They bring in the ark. And this time, though they've experienced God's terrifying holiness, they come with even greater joy because we can rejoice in the holy God who has made a way. Now let's come in at verse 11. Uh, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. It's God's intention for his people. It was, was never judgment. It was blessing. So we're told David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. This time David gets it right. Uh, they followed God's word and they carried the ark as they were meant to. David made sacrifices along the way, remembering that God is a holy God, uh, but that he'd made a way for us to have relationship, for our sin to be atoned for so that we can stand in his presence. So we made these animal sacrifices. But the most striking thing about this passage is that the joy has returned. In fact, the joy seems even greater. They'd learned a painful lesson about God's holiness we might think that now they were walking on eggshells, sort of afraid that they might do something wrong and they'd be struck down by God again. But instead, there is this joy, this freedom, because they'd remembered that God was the holy God, but they'd also remembered that God had made a way for the, to dwell with him and he'd been very clear. And so when they followed his commands, they could walk with him in complete freedom and joy. Uh, and it became, again, a celebration. David rejoiced in the holy God who had made a way. When you realise that you can't by yourself enjoy God's presence, 
but that God has made a way for you to be in relationship with him? When you realise that the God of the universe wants a relationship with you and has done everything necessary to make it happen, that's something that can fuel your joy, that you can rejoice in. Listen, listen to verse 17. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, a cake of raisins to everyone. Then all of the people departed, each to his house. So the party returns. They remember that God had made a way on his terms. uh, And when they followed that way, they were free to rejoice not worrying that God would sort of turn around and strike them because God had been very clear and God was welcoming them into relationship. They rejoice, though there's one person who doesn't join the party. Verse 16, we were told that the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Verse 20, David returned to bless his household, but Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honoured himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince of Israel, the people of the Lord, and I will celebrate before the Lord. I'll make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I'll be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you've spoken, by them I shall be held in honour. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Michal thought that David had disgraced himself. Showing such joy and freedom wasn't the place of a king. But we're reminded several times that she was the daughter of Saul representing the old order, that which was being replaced. She seemed to focus on what people will see, what people will think, what the eyes of the servants will see, rather than what the eye of the Lord sees. David reminds us several times that he was doing this before the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, not before people. This is typical of Saul's reign. Saul was the king who was impressive in the sight of the people. Yet David was the king who was actually after God's own heart. And we're not told that God stopped Michal from having children. It could be that this caused such a rift in David and Michal's relationship that they just never had children. Uh, but we see here that the, the dynasty of Saul, his house, it's, it's on the way out. Uh, but, but this account, this final strange account, this one party pooper, Well, actually, it reveals some of the tension that we find in this passage because we have a holy God, yet we can also rejoice in his presence. And this is a tension that we feel sometimes when we talk about our church services. When it comes to worship in church, uh, some will say that church should be serious. Uh, It should be reverent. Everyone should wear their finest clothes. Children should, should remain silent because we're in the presence of a holy God. Where others will say, that's just what Mikhail would say. Uh, Church should be about joy and celebration. I should be free to dance and sing, uh, wave flags, however I feel led before the Lord. It's just between me and God. And the thing is, both people are getting something right. Uh, Both people are reflecting uh, the truth of this passage. We do worship a holy God and we're to worship him on his terms as he's revealed to us in his word. And that's why when we, we gather, well, that's, we only want to sing songs and pray prayers and do things will, that will reflect uh, the truth of who God is, who he's revealed himself to be in Jesus Christ. But we might come from church backgrounds uh, that have taken human traditions and raised them up to the same level. That said, actually, if you want to honour God, you need to dress this way or not dress this way. Or you need to have this kind of smile or this kind of frown. 
where that's taking human tradition, but that's not what God requires of us. On the other side, it's right to celebrate and rejoice before God. Uh, We, I think we need to have a deep abiding joy in God. It's right to celebrate him. And we do those things before an audience of one, not before anyone else. Yet God's word tells us that one of the main ways we serve him is by loving others. One of the main ways we honour him when we gather in church is by making everything understandable by taking away any obstacles to people understanding the gospel. So if I do anything in a church service that's an obstacle to someone hearing and grasping the good news of Jesus, then I might need to honour the God I worship by holding back for the sake of others. But this passage isn't really about church services. It's about our relationship with God. We can rejoice in a holy God who has made a way. Because we don't uh, just worship God at church one day a week. All of life is lived before the Lord in the presence of God. Uh, His Holy Spirit now dwells in us. Jesus is with us always, which means all of life as we work, as we play, as we rest, as we go to church, uh, all of it, it's done before the Lord. So in all of our life, there should be a concern for holiness because our holy God is with us. The God who struck down Uzzah is with us and he's told us what he requires of us. He's given us commands. Yet we can be filled with joy and confidence because this holy God has made a way for us to dwell with him. He is our God, we are his people. And it's not through laws or sacrifices or an ark, but through Jesus. God has made a way for us to dwell with him And we only do it on his terms, but those terms are quite simple. It's through Jesus. Through Jesus, we have confidence to know that our sins are forgiven because Jesus died for them on the cross. Through Jesus, we have intimacy with the Father because we're united to the perfect Son of the Father and we approach the Father through him. Through Jesus, we can obey God's word without fear, knowing that we're already accepted, obeying out of joy and thankfulness. Through Jesus, uh, we can grow in holiness because we're united to the Holy One who became flesh for us and our salvation. Through Jesus, we can rejoice knowing that God is our God. We are his people. and He's made a way for us to be with him forever. This is the truth that's celebrated uh, in Hebrews chapter 10. And I'll finish by reading us a few verses from Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 19 that tell us the way, the terms that God has given us by which we can now approach him and know him. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Praise God. Oh!
all creation rises to rejoice Who has given counsel to the Lord Who can quest Brothers and sisters, uh, as we go from here, uh, let's reflect on what God has shown us by his word. Uh, you could answer these two questions uh, by yourself or, or with others. Uh, firstly, uh, how can you reflect God's holiness in your life this week? And second, uh, how can you rejoice in the God who has made a way for you this week? Uh, you can take a moment to reflect on those questions right now.
Brothers and sisters, here again God's word to us from Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, uh, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, well, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. God bless and I'll see you next week.